Hello again. So one area where reform and the reform movement has installed, at least noticeably, is in the state, on the state level. And so we're going to devote our last panel of the um, symposium to what I hope is a much more optimistic um, <laughs> uh, session with some good news about what's going on in some, in some of the states. Um, not all of them, but a great number of them are doing things that are really worth noting and worth reporting on. And uh, Bruce Posley is going to be our moderator on that, and he will introduce our speakers for the final session, which will be an hour and a half until about 5 p.m. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm really, uh, of all, and not just because I'm moderating, I've been looking forward to this because I think these are just some great news stories. Um, and I, by that, I mean not just terrific, but they're good news um, stories in, in a time where there seems to be a certain amount of rising levels of pessimism uh, on this front. I'm going to... Um, Start with speaker um, Brian Egolf uh, because he has a um, uh, another commitment. Um, I did. I just learned that um, uh, you all the work that you do as a representative is essentially gratis, um, and so you have to have a real job, <laughs> quote unquote, real job. Um, it, I'm going to start with you. You're the, uh, and, and I'm going to introduce all of our panelists uh, right before they speak. Uh, he's the 30th speaker of the New Mexico House of Representatives. And this year, uh, this past year, he championed passage of the New Mexico Civil Rights Act, which made New Mexico the first state in the nation to abolish, to abolish qualified immunity for all government agencies and essentially provide a path to justice uh, for people in New Mexico whose constitutional rights are violated. I, honestly, when I found out this, I thought, how did I not hear about this before? Because this is incredible. Um, this is something that's been talked about um, and um, stomped on uh, you know, across the country. And here you did it. Um, What's your what's your secret sauce? What's your playbook? Well, you know, I, I fear that you may have not heard about it because your local paper might have put it in uh, international news. We're constantly struggling to remind people that uh, we are one of the 50 states and that we are, in fact, uh, not a foreign country. Um, uh, that's sadly not a joke. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, the way we did it uh, was... You know, in in 2000, you know, seeing what happened in uh, Minnesota with the murder of George Floyd really galvanized, uh, you know, across the country. It happened here as well, and it motivated me to look back into the issue of qualified immunity. I had experienced it just once as a lawyer. Uh, and you're right, no, I'm actually in, in my law office, so you don't have the flags and stuff behind me. Uh, we're in New Mexico, the last unpaid volunteer citizen legislature. So my 2.30 appointment is I've got a client coming in, so I've got to see them at 2.30. Um, but a few years ago, my uh, law partner, uh, Kate Furlick, was representing a young boy who had been brutally raped and abused sexually by foster, a foster family over the course of many months, just horrific abuse involving multiple children, uh, you know, awful, uh, really just beyond description. And uh, she took the case to federal court and we lost on qualified immunity because there was not a, a written opinion from the 10th circuit informing foster parents that it's violating the rights of the child to uh, rape and abuse them. And I, I could not believe that that was the law. I mean, it just did not seem po possible to me that in this country that is the case, but unfortunately it is. So I, uh, I saw qualified immunity present a problem outside of the law enforcement context in that point, but I knew how I was aware, of course, of the law enforcement issues but seeing that qualified immunity was so much broader, um, I started uh, researching it, found a member of Congress, Justin Amash, who introduced a bill to abolish it uh, in Congress that didn't obviously pass. 
Uh, we had a special session to deal with uh, COVID and our state's response. We met in a special session in June of 2020, and uh, I introduced a bill that created the New Mexico Civil Rights Commission. And what it did is it was tasked with answering a few questions about the need for a civil rights cause of action in state law, uh, whether attorney fees should be a part of that as they are in federal court, uh, looked at the issue of qualified immunity, and the commission bill passed. Uh, it was comprised of seven members, including our retired uh, state Supreme Court Chief Justice, uh, a very well-respected district judge, um, a former federal assistant U.S. attorney, um, and uh, we, there was a county sheriff and a local police officer, uh, police chief, and they spent six months. Uh, they had a sizable budget. Uh, they got uh, input uh, from experts all over the country and uh, voted on uh, presenting a uh, model law to the legislature. Uh, and it was supported with a 150 page report that looked at everything from, you know, how qualified immunity was misused and abused in other states. They did a, an incredibly detailed analysis of every federal case filed under Section 1983 in New Mexico federal courts for a decade and looking at what uh, how often qualified immunity was used to uh, dismiss a case, how often it was the sole uh, cause of dismissal, and the types of cases that were not being uh, taken to a jury. And that opened a lot of eyes. Uh, so we had this report, we had the commissioners who then came and supported me and my co-sponsor, uh, Representative Georgine Lewis, um, who's a member of the Acoma Pueblo, uh, which is a, one of our Native American tribes in New Mexico. And uh, that she and I teamed up to get this done, and we faced the unified opposition of every law enforcement agency in the state, uh, every county government, every municipal government were all opposed, uh, but we were able to use the work of the Civil Rights Commission to answer every single question that was raised. You know, we anticipated, we worked with the ACLU, uh, the, of course, they were heavily involved. We also had um, the Cato Institute, Americans for Prosperity. So we had everything from the ACLU to the Koch brothers uh, supporting this effort. Uh, had a very broad coalition behind the bill outside of the building. Uh, we did not get any Republican support at all in spite of uh, conservative organizations supporting the bill. Uh, so we had to do it just with the Democrats, uh, but we were incredibly well prepared. We had lawyers that worked in this area uh, testify with me uh, as expert witnesses at every step of the way. We approached it with a big, uh, a large willingness to amend the bill as it went through the process. And we, by having conservatives outside of the building supporting the bill, it really helped us to anticipate questions that we would get uh, so that we could have amendments and changes to the bill ready. Uh, what ended up passing uh, has created what is essentially an analog to Section 1983 uh, in our state statutes. Uh, you can use it to uh, file a claim for violation of any of the rights listed in our state's uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, attorney's fees are available. There is a cap on damages of $2 million. That was a, an essential give because we had lots of small county governments and small cities who had convinced a number of members that their municipal governments were going to be bankrupted and that, um, you know, city parks were going to be seized and sold off to pay judgments. Uh, our retort to that of, well, you know, just train your officers properly and don't violate the rights of your citizens that you represent. You won't have to worry about it. Uh, but we, we did have to have a give on that. We kept the damages. Um, we have it so that um, we also had to take into account um, uh, organized labor. New Mexico is a democratic state, and we stand with our unions on every uh, issue that we can. And there were a number of uh, public employee unions that were very concerned about uh, their members uh, being sued um, for, uh, you know, things that wouldn't typically be um, a civil rights cause of action in federal court. We wanted to make sure that uh, as the jurisprudence develops around this law that 
Uh, we have real civil rights cases, you know, that we don't have slip and falls at a county building shoehorned into the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so, and we don't want to have you know, run of the mill uh, employment cases brought under the Civil Rights Act. So we excluded um, the ability of uh, uh, state employees to bring a New Mexico Civil Rights Act claim uh, against a public employer uh, for an employment cause of action. So they would have to use the Human Rights Act or um, our other employment statutes that are on the books. And then we had the causes of action be brought exclusively against the governmental entity. Um, you know, we, we decided that if we you know, don't have to deal with the 11th Amendment because we're in state court, why go through the uh, exercise of the fiction of suing an individual government actor? Uh, there isn't that prohibition in state court, and it's the governmental entities that pay the judgments anyway. Uh, so we uh, had the claims brought against uh, the governmental uh, entity that was really done to address the concerns, you know, whether they were well founded or not, there were serious concerns from public employees. And so we, we made that give in order to get the bill over the finish line. We thought it was more important to have a cause of action on the books uh, than to spend, uh, you know, we didn't want to elevate the, the, the form over the substance. And we wanted to give the path to justice, as you said, to the people of the state and not, not worry too much about whether they're suing you know, the city government or an individual city employee. So those are some of the main um, changes that we made to the bills that went through some of the differences from the federal uh, statute. Uh, we're starting to see the first cases uh, be uh, noticed. So there is a notice provision and you have to give notice to the government uh, in the, only in the instance of a claim against uh, law enforcement for a wrongful death or that results in a death. There is a notice provision there. Uh, there have been some notices uh, for that. Uh, the rest uh, cases are starting to be filed. Uh, and one interesting thing is some of the conservatives who uh, didn't like it are now realizing that they can use the Civil Rights Act to vindicate some of the rights in the, in the Bill of Rights that uh, are important in their communities, uh, such as uh, religious liberty uh, and right to, we have a, we have a Bill of Rights uh, provision uh, giving the people of New Mexico the right to participate in free and fair elections. So uh, there are some cases that are being looked at uh, when uh, in one that I'm hearing about a church was denied a, a building permit and uh, folks are looking at bringing a civil rights act, a New Mexico civil rights act case against a uh, city zoning, uh, or, uh, a city in New Mexico for a violation of their rights uh, to religious liberty uh, through the denial of a building permit. So it's, I think going to be a little uh, broader than just the law enforcement context here, although we have had, uh, unfortunately, you know, incident uh, in uh, Las Cruces, that's our largest uh, southern city, um, when uh, Antonio Valenzuela was a resident of Las Cruces and he was uh, killed by a law enforcement officer uh, under circumstances that are virtually identical to uh, the conduct that took the life of George Floyd. So it, it certainly is on our minds here. Uh, as well. So that's, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much, but that's kind of an overview of where we are. And uh, we would hope that the way, not just the bill itself, but the process that we went through uh, could be a model for other states. And I, I really cannot overemphasize the importance of having that um, civil rights commission do good, thorough work informed by national experts in the field uh, that added a huge amount of credibility. Uh, to the process. Uh, and uh, I think if other states want to follow uh, in our footsteps, that's a piece that uh, I would strongly encourage folks to, uh, to undertake. Let me just ask you a couple questions, um, Speaker. Um, and you talked about the uh, analysis of, 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 I think, a decade uh, worth of cases. Um, what, and, and you said that that, or indicated, suggested that that was fairly damning. Um, can you give me give us a little bit of a sense of what what that found? Yeah, so I'll have to do this off the top of my head. I'm a little rusty. Well, I'm not going to hold you to the numbers. Yeah. I just... <laughs> you know, it was about um, of the cases in which so we, there were about 1,700 cases uh, filed under 1983 in the period that was looked at. Uh, I believe that uh, qualified immunity was asserted in about. 300 
So it was a little less than a fifth. Uh, it resulted in uh, dismissals in about half of those cases. So about 10% uh, of the cases were tossed. Mm -hmm. And in about half of those, so 5%, uh, they were dismissed where the sole reason for dismissal was qualified immunity. Now the cases included the one, like I just mentioned of the, the, you know, the sexual, sexual abuse and rape of a child. Um, there were you know, quite a few involving law enforcement. So the data was helpful to us in two ways. One, because it showed that uh, it is resulting in cases uh, being thrown out of court that have obvious merit. Uh, to when a layperson looks at the facts of the case, they can't believe that there's no opportunity for justice for people that have suffered the kind of uh, injuries to their constitutional rights is what was shown in those cases. The other way it was helpful is it countered the argument that there was this huge flood of uh, civil rights cases that was going to sweep through the courts and without the shield of qualified immunity, courts would be overrun, governments would be bankrupted, because we were able to show that out of the total number of cases that were filed under 1983, qualified immunity only took place in about 5% uh, of those cases. Uh, so it, it helped us to uh, convince some members of the legislature uh, that we were unlikely to face a, a huge number of costly uh, cases. You know, I, I think that's a really important point to make because um, in my experience uh, as a journalist, when you see um, when, when um, Illinois, for example, was one of the first, if not the first state to pass a post-conviction DNA testing statute, um, the, the, the cries on the floor of the legislature were we're going to, the courts are going to be overrun. The, and every, every person in the Illinois Department of Corrections who had some physical evidence in this case is going to be filing a motion. And, and you know, history tells us this is not true. It doesn't happen. Um, and in fact, um, the number of claims that where the testing is done and they're good for it um, is very, very low. Um, and so I, I do think that that's a really important uh, factor to, you know, face it. My, my belief has always been that immunity protects the unethical. Um, it doesn't protect, I mean, it, it, the, the ethical prosecutor, the ethical, you know, the pe person who does it right doesn't need it. Uh, it only is the ones that, uh, that, that commit the violations, you know, that it protects. And so um, I hope that uh, uh, because you have to leave early, I, I'd really like to encourage people to ask questions because we're, we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna have them for uh, the whole, the whole por portion of the panel here. But um, the, and I did the, just put, by the way, in the chat, I hope that attendees can see this. I put a link to the Civil Rights Commission report uh -huh. uh, so folks can see, you know, what the product was. Uh, and as we're waiting for questions, uh, another thought um, that would be helpful if, you know, folks are looking at doing this elsewhere is uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act here in New Mexico revealed a profound and absolutely almost universal misunderstanding among members of law enforcement uh, about what qualified immunity is. So, there was a lot of talk among uh, law enforcement officers that with the end of qualified immunity, uh, they were going to be sued and be personally liable for walking across the street. You know, they thought that it was an immunity against them personally um, having to be held accountable for basically anything. So there, there was... It, it, there was, a, there was a feeling among law enforcement that qualified immunity makes them immune from virtually everything. And that by eliminating qualified immunity, they were going to be subject to any number of frivolous lawsuits and they were going to be losing their houses and they would have no, you know, their bank accounts would be taken away and things like that. So it, there's been a massive effort that we have undertaken to 
explain to members of law enforcement that if you follow your training, that if you uh, are not acting outside of the Constitution, that you have nothing to fear. And we have that added protection here in New Mexico where individual law enforcement officers are not going to be the defendant in a case. We did that to try to preempt concern among individual law enforcement officers. Uh, that was not uh, as successful as, as some of the other things we tried because uh, the opposition to the law remains pretty um, widespread among law enforcement. Uh, and you know, we'd, we'd like to get past that. Uh, I don't know if it's possible, but we are certainly giving it a try. It, has there been any threat of a legal challenge to the, to the statute? No, I mean, the most we hear is, you know, we uh, will hear things like, you know, anecdotal reports that a law enforcement officer will uh, quit the force in Farmington, New Mexico, which is on the, uh, which is in Northern New Mexico on the border of Colorado, and that they move to Durango, Colorado, across the border and become a police officer there. You know, or we hear things like, you know, police, you know, recruits don't want to come to New Mexico or people are leaving the state. There's nothing measurable. Um, and we're also dealing right now with, um, I think there's universal recognition among Democrats and Republicans in the legislature that we've got a, a crisis of violent crime in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, you know, the murder rate has uh, more than doubled in the last two years, a huge amount of property crime, uh, a lot of small businesses, you know, getting hurt and uh more than a few people in law enforcement are trying to blame all of the problems with uh, violent crimes and property crime in Albuquerque on the Civil Rights Act. Because they're saying, oh, well, we would like to enforce the law. We would like to make arrests, but we're afraid to do our jobs because of the Civil Rights Act. So that, that's not a widely held or you know, widely attempted argument, but uh, there are some, like the head of the police officers union in Albuquerque, uh, who blames the Civil Rights Act for all things that are wrong uh, in law enforcement. So, well, right. If, if you watched uh, the uh, judicial confirmation hearing of Nina Morrison a couple of weeks ago, you'll see that one of the most celebrated Innocence Project lawyers uh, in the history of the exhort organization but behind Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld um, is responsible for the uh, rise in crime rate of, for exonerating wrongfully convicted. I mean, uh, the, the, the arguments that get launched um, sometimes uh, are almost ridiculous on its face, but it, it's amazing how there's a fear factor out there that sometimes gets traction with people. Yep. One thing that we all, you know, I'll um, say well, I'm is... not seeing any questions um, okay. and I don't, I know you have um, a livelihood. So um, sure. I'm, uh, if you want to stick around a little bit uh, till you have to go, I'm going to, Move on to Rebecca Brown, uh, who is uh, so. the uh, head uh, of there policy. Is a, there is a question from uh, one question, but uh, I don't it must have just popped it. in. Just popped in, yeah. Well, it's more okay. It's more crime related. Has it's any connection in in Albuquerque been made between police misconduct and violence there? Do you know of? You know, uh, not that I know of. Uh, you are correct that um, Albuquerque is uniquely screwed up. I mean, you know, and, you know, one of the first things that we do is, you know, we have to acknowledge that. I mean, it's, it is a widely held view because it's happening, right? And uh, we did in this last session of the legislature um, pass about $30 million worth, uh, or no, oh, sorry, about $130 million worth of investments in new ideas to try to address crime. Uh, one of the most exciting ones is we call it's the violence intervention program. And what we do is we go into, well, the classic example that was used is uh, a drug deal or some sort of transaction between uh, folks involved in the uh, narcotics trade. Uh, there's an exchange of gunfire. Uh, one person is arrested. And then the, uh, the proponents of this program, you know, they say the non-innocent victim, right? So the other person in this drug transaction uh, is not arrested. The program goes to the non-innocent victim and tries to help them avoid uh, committing violence in retribution uh, against the person that was the original puller of a trigger. Uh, we've done a pilot on that. Um, 
in two communities with a few hundred thousand dollars in funding, we put $10 million into it, mm-hmm. which for those of you in other states, you know, $10 million is, you know, kind of seems like a rounding error for us. That's a sizable amount of money. We're a state of 2 million people. So it's a, it's a big investment and we're hoping that that will be something to, um, you know, reduce violent crime. Uh, but it's not exactly on, on point with the question. So uh-huh. anyway, thanks everybody. Appreciate your attention and your interest in New Mexico. Come visit us. It's great. You got skiing now, warm summers. We have mountains. Uh, we're not Arizona and we'd love to see you. Not Arizona. All right. Thanks very much, speaker. Uh, Rebecca uh, Brown is uh, joined the Innocence Project in 2005. I was looking at that number and it's like, oh my gosh, how did this time fly by? She directs federal and state policy agenda. Uh, she was a policy analyst with the mayor's office in New York City in the past and a senior planner at the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services and uh, has been my go-to person for a long time to find out what's going on uh, in the world of criminal justice reform. Um, and so I'm, I'd really like you to kind of give us, um, it's going to put a quart in a pint container here and and tell us, you know, give us a sense of the landscape. Sure. Thanks so much, Maurice. It's nice to be with you. And it's so wonderful to, and just really exciting to lead this session with, I think, one of the most robust robust reforms to come out of the 2021 legislative sessions in New Mexico. Um, you know, the U.S. continues to lead the world in incarceration, given that over 6.3 million people are under correctional supervision. Um, despite having 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population, there were some successful efforts during the 2021 sessions to reduce prison admissions and really to recalibrate extreme sentencing practices. And among those wins, um, Colorado and Illinois address felony murder statutes for cases when individuals did not directly cause the death of another person, no longer subjecting defendants um, you know, to mandatory life without parole. Virginia uh, lawmakers abolished the death penalty with retroactive sentence modifications. And this was, you know, the first state in the Confederacy to eliminate the death penalty. So a huge, huge win in Virginia. And in Washington, policymakers established a second look resentencing policy for certain robbery offenses. Um, Several state houses also worked to challenge racial disparity. The California Assembly uh, adopted a resolution to implement equity impact legislation policy. So the resolution really um, encourages the assembly to explore methods to integrate equity more formally into its daily activities, but also equity impact statements into bill analysis for proposed sentencing laws. Uh, Also during 2021, Maine lawmakers authorized a racial impact statement policy to conduct a study to determine the best method to establish and implement a racial impact statement policy for legislation. Maryland officials established a pilot program that includes racial impact statements as part of the legislative analysis process that was developed by the nonpartisan Department of Legislative Services. And Virginia lawmakers adopted a bill to establish the state's racial impact statement policy, which authorizes uh, preparations of racial and ethnic impact statements for proposed criminal justice legislation. Um, There were also efforts to expand the franchise. So we have 5.2 million people in the US currently denied access access to the vote because of felony convictions. And so to address voter suppression this year, Connecticut, New York, and Washington state joined the more than 20 other states uh, by limiting voter restrictions to people in prison. Police practice and accountability. This was an area that we really expected and wanted to see a lot of action in. Um, And there were a few wins right uh, following the murder of George Floyd um, in those 2020 sessions. Uh, Things like repealing 50A here in New York State, um, which uh, really made police disciplinary records for the first time publicly available here in New York. Um, And following that in the 2021 sessions, Maryland, Connecticut, and California made police disciplinary records, um, at least some. Uh, publicly available. Um, Obviously, we just heard about qualified immunity in New Mexico, uh, which was huge qualified immunity uh, reform. uh, And that followed on the heels of Colorado the year before doing that, not for all officials, but for law enforcement. So um, that was a huge win. Um, Ohio, Washington, and Delaware passed laws requiring the recordation of custodial interrogations. Um, And uh, two bills very near and close 
near and dear to our hearts at the Innocence Project, uh, we work for the first time to really address methods that are used in the interrogation room. Uh, law enforcement can use deception during the course of custodial interrogations. They can lie to people about the presence of evidence that does not exist or imply that people will get a more lenient sentence if they just confess to the crime. Um, in both uh, Illinois and Oregon, uh, deception was banned during interrogations for minors. Um, so these were huge wins and we're gonna hear soon from Senator Peters who championed that effort in, in Illinois and we're so grateful to him for that. Uh, when it comes to limiting incarceration for probation and parole, uh, you know, we saw some wins there too. Uh, nationally, more than 20% of prison admissions are caused by technical violations of parole. Um, and so in 2021, several states enacted legislative measures to address this, including New York. In New York, policymakers passed a bill to limit incarceration for technical parole violations and to establish 30-day uh, maximum jail terms for technical violations. Virginia lawmakers limited probation. Uh, under the legal reform, adult probation terms for misdemeanors can only be one year, while felony probation terms cannot exceed five years. Uh, and there were some efforts as well to promote youth justice. Um, of course, I mentioned those deception bans uh, for youth, but also uh, lawmakers adopted policies that demonstrate really a commitment to protecting juvenile defendants and expanding parole options for uh, people sentenced in their youth. Um, and these changes in policy continue a trend that really seeks to change the response to juvenile crime by adopting mechanisms to depart from mandatory minimums and establish sentence review procedures. Maryland joined 24 states and DC in eliminating juvenile life without parole as a sentencing option, allowing anyone convicted as a minor who served at least 20 years to petition a court for release or sentence reduction. A law in Colorado also allows judges to suspend mandatory minimums for youth who are transferred to adult court. New York lawmakers adopted legislation which allows a person who's received their sentence to apply for a new youthful offender status determination and for a court to provide relief from the civil consequences of criminal conviction. And uh, finally, eight states, uh, Alaska, Connecticut, Indiana, Iowa, Missouri, North Dakota, Oklahoma, and Utah adopted legislation to remove youth charged as adults from jails and prisons to comply with the Federal Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. And Kentucky lawmakers passed a law to end the automatic transfer of youth into adult court and so we definitely saw some gains, but the state legislatures are really racked by partisanship, um, really politicizing issues for the first time, including even innocence reforms. For instance, as of right now, and following last year's election in Virginia resulting in a divided government, the very law our policy team successfully passed last year, which made police investigative files publicly available, is now under attack and has a good chance of being repealed. So in many ways, advocates seeking to reimagine the criminal legal system find themselves in more of a defensive mode, seeking to protect recent gains. But I'm very energized uh, by the next two panelists who helped to keep us energized and, and holding on to the promise of transformational change. So here's to you. Well, I was gonna, um, I was gonna follow up and say, now that you've given us the good news, what is the bad news? Because there must be bad news out there. Um, and. I would imagine, you know, when you say this partisanship, this is currently the kind of the state of the country. Absolutely. And I mean, we obviously saw that in Congress, uh, we were seeking the passage of the George Floyd Act. And in fact, the provision that really held that up was the elimination of qualified immunity. Um, and so that, you know, makes all of us want to redouble our efforts in the states. So we really do look to states like Colorado and New Mexico as models uh, to continue that fight. But yes, partisanship is huge. And really, it is politicizing issues that have not been political before. So that has been a huge issue. Obviously, uh, the rise in the murder rate across the country has been very difficult. Um, we're also seeing in the state houses some backlash because we saw some uh, modest and in some cases, you know, transformational uh, police accountability reforms. And now we're seeing real pushback, not, not a lot of interest in revisiting police accountability issues in the state houses. So I think there are a lot of dynamics. We're also in an election year. Um, so that's made, you know, this a tougher year for us as well. Um, but we're really seeing, you know, these dynamics play out in state house after state house. And, you know, in many ways, um, we find ourselves in, you know, this defensive mode, but yet at the same time, we see these, um, you know, incredible efforts that, you know, are just amazing to watch, right? The New Mexico Civil Rights Act being 
among them. Um, and just transformational change, you know, from Michigan to Illinois. So I think, you know, we are seeing some changes. I just think that we, um, in many ways, are in more of a protective mode um, as advocates. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Senator Peters um, because I want to hear the story of how this came to be. Um, and I think there's an interesting, uh, at least historical note uh, here. Um, the the uh, the first, well, I'm going to go back about 20 years when Governor Ryan set up a commission, sort of similar to what Speaker Egoff was talking about, to look at um, death penalty in Illinois, and there were a number of of uh, proposals. I think 86. I've heard George say this. I think that's the number, but. Um, only a couple were ever uh, passed, and one was recording of interrogations in homicide cases. And I think you know some history about that. I know that a particular predecessor of mine that looms large over me uh, helped make that happen. Um, and uh, so I was, uh, at the time, State Senator Barack Obama, um, if I'm correct. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, Illinois, has, as I think people have read, if they've read about it, has a history of being the false confession capital of the world or the wrongful conviction capital of the world. Uh, either or is horrible. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've been trying to do a lot of work to move away from that reputation, particularly Chicago. Chicago stands out more than the rest of the state, but um, we're trying to move away from that reputation. And, you um, you know, really to Rebecca and to the Illinois Innocence Project and uh, to the Center for, Center for Wrongful Convictions, uh, this has been a fight for a long time. And I remember when we first started on this, the amount of work that they did, I mean, I carried it, but the amount of work done is to make this a bipartisan supported bill in Illinois is truly historic. Um, and to get what, you know, the minority leader right now is currently railing on some uh, tough on crime dog whistle politics. And to see him having supported the bill uh, last year uh, tells you about how much work and, and organizing went into making us pass um, a bill that made it uh, illegal to um, deceive young people during interrogations, to make it in, in, inadmissible in court. So it was, and to the point where that work led to recently there was a controversy in Waukegan, Illinois, which is a northern suburb, uh, northern town in Illinois, where um, a young person uh, was being deceived and level of um, the state's attorney up there, the district attorney, as most people would say outside of Illinois, uh, jumped on top of it uh, to support the reform that we did and to call out the deception that was being used and how it was, you know, breaking the law, um, and how they shouldn't have been doing that. It was just, it, it really is um, a historic achievement. And in, in Illinois in general, uh, the last 16 months was ab absolutely historic for, you know, criminal justice reform or public safety policy. You know, we went for, we had a the passage of a Black Caucus pillar, the criminal justice reform pillar, and we didn't stop. I mean, the passage uh, of our um, anti-deception bill uh, happened after we passed uh, a historic pillar. So I, I think the best way to put it is that um, we knew that 2022 was going to be a difficult year to pass uh, any reform or any changes uh, and to reimagine public safety. And we spent all of last year basically uh, running 100 miles per hour to get whatever we can get done uh, to create the, the type of change that we needed. I think I answered, and I, I rambled actually, this is what's really good. If nobody knows, I always joke, I was born deaf and had a speech impediment. So when I get to talk, I'll just keep talking. It's just a thing. <laughs> no, that was great. I, I'm curious. Um, I remember uh, when um, Barack's bill uh, was proposed and going through and, and the, the pushback uh, from police about recording homicide interrogations was, well, nobody's ever going to confess again. And we'll never, you know, you've taken away, you're taking away our ability to solve crimes. And of course, that's just not 
proved to be not true. Um, what sort of pushback did you get um, on this one? So honestly, um, again, because of the work that was done to talk to uh, the minority party, uh, the conservative side, um, we had broad support. I think what actually happened is people then asked, well, you're doing young people. Um, what about adults? Uh, and it sort of became the point of what about adults and uh, some of the stuff that some people who were being a bit contrarian was like, this isn't enough. It doesn't do anything around adults. And I always laugh and I go, I'm, you, you think I, I don't want to just stop at, you know, young people. Of course, I want to take this to the next level uh, when it comes to um, adults. But I think that because we passed this broader uh, criminal justice pillar that we call the Safety Act, um, a lot of the pushback has been focused on some of those pieces. So we ended cash bail in Illinois. That was sort of the first entryway to uh, attack uh, and do a wink and a nod, dog whistle, wink and a nod. And then we had a felony murder reform piece of legislation. Uh, and that became the second space that they decided to go after. And then um, the, we did some police reform and what always happens when you do any police reform, you do anything around police. This is why I always say you can't, you, you could never not do enough police reform. Even if you do the smallest amount, uh, you'll hear about how it was the worst thing ever and everything. Um, but what we do is interesting around m many of the bills that we did pass in Illinois. And I had the privilege to be able to sponsor a good chunk of them. Uh, and it's something that's a point of pride. I was an organizer beforehand and I organized the coalition and then to be able to carry them is something a point of pride. But what we did with a lot of pieces uh, was delayed, we did not an immediate effective date. Um, they tend to have delayed um, effective dates. So that there's a few things. A, if there's any kinks, you can work out the kinks, uh, get them right, right before you have an immediate effective date. Can, we, many of us learned on almost, on, oh, let me say this, on every issue involving criminal justice reform, we learned from New York on, um, and uh, so we learned from New York um, about bail reform where they had an immediate effective date, basically a short, very short effective date. And basically how the press, you know, I know I'm talking to press here went really, I mean, there's a New York Post headline that will always still disturb me to this day. Um, and we thought, okay, well, actually what we do is if we delay these even, and have intentional processes, um, there's a few things. Nobody can blame us for not being intentional to get the policy right. If we have to clean up the policy, we can do that before it goes live. And then uh, on the last part is that reactionaries will trash a policy and forget that that policy hasn't gone live and they look stupid. So for many of the things that we did, we would put, you know, like I'll use the ending cash bond that doesn't go into effect until the 1st of January, 2023. So the amount of people who were like, this is the reason why violence is so bad. I would always laugh because we'd be like, well, actually what you're mad about is the thing we're getting rid of. So what you're mad about is the status quo. The thing that you say you want to keep is literally the thing currently. Uh, and what we're going to bring in is a whole new system, but that doesn't go into effect until next, next year. And that's when you started seeing people shift from complaining about bond or using bond as a political uh, hit to move it over to felony murder uh, because they knew that felony murder on its own sounds bad. Uh, it's not, it's basically to make sure that uh, we don't have situations uh, around uh, accountability. So if you're a group of young kids and you were breaking into someone's home, uh, someone said the New York Post and the press are two different things. Uh, I, I understand that. <laughs> Let me not do that. Let me not do that to anybody. Um, so we, it was essentially, it was built out of, uh, what happened in Lake County where some young kids were, uh, breaking into someone's home and another, one of the kids that was with them got, uh, shot and killed sadly. And then, uh, all the other kids were being charged. Um, and so a lot of the things that we've done in Illinois around, you know, deception, around bond, around um, felony murder, around a whole host of things come from the fact that Illinois has a shameful history on some of its practices and people have been organizing and fighting to change this 
for years. And so um, we, you know, I, to quote a lot of people um, who say that when there's a crisis, there's an opportunity, that is in fact true. And that is okay. There was a crisis in 2020, a variety of crises, uh, and it was particularly painful uh, if you were black and, um, and then if you were an immigrant uh, in, in this country. And we as a black caucus responded to that crisis and then kept going. And it's something I think is a point of pride. I, I go out to California. My, uh, my future father-in-law is a very proud uh, LA resident, likes to brag about LA. Often when we think about Chicago or Illinois and our level of insecurities or how we're used as a joke, uh, we don't tend to brag about where we're from. Uh, and whether it's LA or if I'm visiting New York, I put on my little Land of Lincoln hat that says Illinois on it. And I say, everybody should be more like us. And uh, I exhibit everything that people hate about Chicago and security and, and, and about what we've done. And I think we are a really good model. Uh, and I see that, you know, a lot of criminal justice reform is in the news. It's a political dog whistle. Uh, and um, I've somehow gone through this whole thing not cursing, so I'm going to try not to curse. But um, what I say is it's not my job to have to answer for the failures of the status quo. And I will never answer for the failures of the status quo. That is their job. I'm going to talk about what we're doing. I'm going to frame it in a way that people definitely need to hear it, which is the battle that we're in is not criminal justice reform versus the status quo. It's public safety for all versus public safety for a few. Fundamentally, I don't, I, me taking on criminal justice issues uh, is out of a place that felt, feels like a necessity. I rather talk about economic justice issues. I rather talk about uh, where we are at in terms of our broader system, systemic issues. But it's almost difficult to get there when we use uh, the criminal justice, the criminal legal system the state as uh, a de facto replacement for the welfare state or for the care state. And I'd rather shift us from relying on putting people in prisons and jails and using horrible child protective services uh, and move to actually giving people what they need. And so I always make this comparison. If you see a safe neighborhood, they all have the, roughly the same thing. Great schools, great jobs, you can get to point A to point B relatively easily. If you're having a healthcare crisis, you know that there's a hospital and healthcare system there. You can afford or you can have uh, a therapist or a social worker or, some, or someone who does care on the mental health side. That does not exist. We've disinvested so painfully in working class communities, particularly working class communities of color. And what we are doing around changing our criminal legal system is fundamentally changing who's allowed to have public safety and who's not. Uh, and I, the way I put this is we are reducing uh, the blue light wall of segregation uh, that particularly exists in Chicago, but per also exists in so many of our communities. Where you see a housing, you know, they always say Chicago has one map. Where you see a housing crisis, where you see the foreclosure crisis, when you see the closure of schools, you see the closures of hospitals and mental health facilities, you also see the areas that are struggling the most with violence. If we're not fundamentally shifting that, we're not actually dealing with violence. And there are some people who are, uh, some of them are, I'm gonna say lazy and don't wanna deal with that. Some of them also know that in order for us to fix that might mean that you know their extraordinary levels of wealth uh, is not sustainable to the extraordinary needs of our communities. And those things need to, to be challenged. And it's, it's difficult, it's politically difficult. It's, uh, I find it exhausting. You know, I, a lot of people come to me with a lot of issues we have to take on. And I, I always say, well, the challenge is to get more and more people like me in positions of power or to move people in positions of power to think more and more like us. Uh, so that, you know, we have more people who are carrying pieces of legislation that fundamentally transform uh, our state and our city. So I, 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 am, I appreciate being honest, being appreciate to talk about this. I really appreciate Rebecca. And, and I really got to say that at the end of the day, there are a lot of us who've been organizing for years to create change. Uh, and they're not organizing. None of us are organizing 
to make communities less safe. At the end of the day, what we're working on and we're organizing around is that if institutions feel like they can lie to young people to coerce a, a confession, or institutions feel like if you are poor that you get to be locked up, but if you're rich, you get to go home. If institutions feel like they can close on your school or they can imprison you while you're going through a mental health crisis, uh, then what you will have are people who have no faith in an institution. And if they don't have faith in the institutions and they don't believe that institutions can change, then how can we ever expect to have a safe city, whether it's New York, Chicago, or LA? So if for everybody who is in New York, you should tell Eric Adams, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And everybody in LA should make sure that during that mayor's race, that people are actually looking out for public safety after Garcetti leaves. And here in, in Chicago and Illinois, we're trying to make sure that uh, whether it's Lori Lightfoot or Jim Durkin, that they get on the same page for what it means to provide safety for everybody. Uh, and I'm done rambling, and I'm sure you have other questions and other things that you need to talk about. Well, it, it's not a ramble, and I thank you. Um, I'm going to switch over to um, Representative Tanisha Yancey from Michigan, who is in her third full term representing the first House District. Um, she is a voice uh, for some of the uh, Michigan's most vulnerable populations, uh, including advocacy for equitable criminal justice reform for adults uh, and juveniles, expanding access to high quality, affordable health care, and protecting seniors from fraud and abuse. Uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, April of 2021, uh, CMCJ Time Report uh, published a story. The headline was Can Michigan? point the way to nationwide jail reform. And it, it, it talks about a package of legislative reforms um, that were signed in the law. And the um, uh, Pew Ch Charitable Trust Public Safety uh, Performance Project said Michigan's historic reforms will not only improve the state's criminal justice systems and the lives of residents, but will serve as a template for other states where jails are driving increased taxpayer costs and on. Um, uh, you were part of that task force. Um, and, and I wonder if you could talk about what, what you, you all did uh, in Michigan and um, sort of uh, take me through a little bit of the process. Um, I'm interested in, in how you fought pushback and um, you know we're a year out now. Um, and you know, what can you tell us about you know since then? Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, and so it was it was actually a very great opportunity for me to serve on the Joint Task Force. It was the Michigan Joint Task Force on Pretrial and Jail Incarceration. Very long name, uh, and we met even longer than its name over some a period of time um, that stretched across over a year and we're still meeting as a matter of fact to this day uh, to ensure that some of those recommendations that we did make are actually implemented. And so what we did here in Michigan, we the governor, Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer, um, she joined or, or created this task force where I was very, very grateful to be a part of um, as a former assistant prosecutor here in Wayne County. Um, I saw injustices across the board. I saw how out of 43 municipalities in our county, um, majority of the defendants primarily came from urban areas such as Detroit. And so some of my counterparts, however, in some of the more rural com communities had some of the same issues that we have here in our urban communities. And we decided that we could work across the aisle on this on this issue and, and do some um, real criminal and, and, and I, don't, I don't know if if uh, Senator Peters would agree with my with my words, but criminal justice reform um, to do some real reform and to do things that would uh, allow for people to um, not necessarily have to come in contact uh, with the court system for things such as driving on a suspended license. So we eliminated the driver's license suspension. Um, and, and again, the process, of course, of course the process was meeting to, to come up with some of the 
issues that we can identify to reduce our jail population. We looked at data to show how many people are actually in jail awaiting a bond or awaiting a court date for driving on a suspended license, or how many people had their bonds revoked because they simply didn't show up for court. And so we, we met and we looked at data to see what that, what that looked like and how many people were actually missing days of work and how many people actually lost jobs because they were simply waiting for our criminal justice process to take take its, take its uh, well, I, I would say due process, but for our criminal justice process to take its course. Um, and, and a lot of it was a lot of red tape. So we worked across the aisle to make um, much needed progress and reforms um, excuse me, in multiple facets of the criminal justice, in, which included eliminating our driver's license suspension as a penalty for infractions unrelated to dangerous driving. Um, you know, if, we, if you have a driver's license that, if you have a suspended driver's license and it was not something where you caused an accident or you caused a death, we were able to um, eliminate those, those penalties or eliminate the penalty being jail. Um, driving without a valid driver's license was the most common charge at our at jail admission for Black residents in our state of Michigan, based on the research that was done uh, by Pew. And so that was one of the biggest accomplishments that we made. And then we were a also able to increase the use of interventions in lieu of arrest. Uh, so in lieu of arrest, instead of... Um, you know, if there's um, we we gave the law enforcement the options instead of having to arrest someone with a warrant, we are now they they are not to automatically assume or or the first step is not to arrest. The first step is to try to to try to find an alternative to an arrest before making an arrest upon a stop. Um, and then we improved our, pro or we're working on improving our probation practices. Um, I attended, uh, a, I actually attended a conference in Florida that, that where they are more like community officers instead of probation officers. Um, and we are looking at some practices here as well, because when you have a, a, a negative connotation or a negative um, experience with this system, then you're likely to not just as the defendant who has to see the probation officer, but the probation officer themselves are automatically in a defense mode as opposed to being in a uh, in a mode of, of community and assistance or helping this person. Um, and so we find that a lot of people are getting probation violations, technical probation violations on things that really aren't criminal in nature, right? And so we're, we're revoking their, or not necessarily their um, parole because this was strictly on the jail basis and not on our prison levels, but we're, we're causing people to violate or we're violating their probation and sending them back to jail for technical violations. So we had to look at that here in Michigan as well to see how we can reduce our jail population uh, for things that are not affecting our community. It's not keeping people safe. Um, if it And we kept our vi victims, obviously we keep our victims at the forefront again as an assistant prosecutor or former assistant prosecutor. Victims um, were at the forefront of our minds and any reform or anything that we uh, worked on. And then we also um, reduced the use of jail time as punishment for many non-violent offenses. And so even so with that, you don't have um, a victim most likely in a non-violent offense. So reducing jail time punishments for retail frauds, or again, eliminating jail time for driving without or driving without a license or driving on a suspended license. These actions helped keep, it, it helps keep our families together. It helps people to be able to stay employed uh, because any time that you miss, it, we're a right to work state now. So even if you miss one day of work in Michigan, you could possibly lo lose your job even if you are in a union environment. So losing um, 
losing jobs and, and losing your ability to be able to provide for your family ultimately affects the entire family unit. And so these actions help help Michigan families to stay together. Um, and it improves and it causes important societal improvements as well throughout time. And so it provides, we, we wanna make sure that we're providing clear paths and utilizing taxpayers' dollars effectively. And we know that incarceration or jail does not do that. We know that um, we, you know, we, we say that we're using our jail system to rehabilitate, but um, we need to, we definitely need to take a deeper look in overall, um, and not just in Michigan, but across the states as to how we are actually utilizing jails. Is it punitive or is it truly to rehabilitate? One of the things um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about was the, the idea of reducing um, probation to a maximum of three years for not all felonies, but for a, a significant amount. And, and you know, you've talked about the revoking. Uh, it's my experience is that, that, that the long probation terms are basically a prescription for failure. Um, it's that, that, and it just leads to people being, you know, those are non, no bond warrants when they're arrested, um, for, if it's a probation revocation warrant. Um, and it's just a, it, what it does is it just fills cells. Absolutely. Um, and, and it just brings back to memory. I just recently had a, an expungement fair in my district and a young lady showed up who was from Atlanta or, or she's from Detroit originally, but she had moved to Atlanta over 15 years ago. And she came to the expungement fair thinking that she would be able to get her record expunged, um, that she could finally get this monkey off her back and not have to worry about her record her criminal record. And there were some uh, opportunities that she was looking at, uh, business opportunities that she was interested in that was that where her criminal record was preventing her from doing um, uh, or, or taking advantage of this opportunity. And so when I ran her iChat or when I ran her you know, record to see what was on her record for us to be able to expunge, I knew, I found out that she had an open warrant. She had an open warrant from 16 years ago on a probation violation. So apparently after talking to the probation department of probation, um, apparently this young lady had um, moved to Atlanta or just left the state without permission from the probation department. And in her mind, in her mind, she had completed probation. That's what she, that's what she thought. However, according to the Department of Probation's record, she had not completed probation. She had just, you know, asked if she could go out of town and never return. So although they did not arrest her on the old warrant, they were, we were able to, to get the old warrant um, removed she was not eligible for expungement because you, you here in, in Michigan, we did a lot on, on that as well on expungement. Um, laws here and expanded those tremendously. But even with the expansion of the laws, you still have to wait five to seven years on a felony um, to have your record expunged. And that's five or seven years after you, you have served your jail time or after you have been released from probation, whichever is later. So as of that day, whatever day it was that I was able to get the Department of Probation to lift her warrant and, and to um, remove or discharge her from probation, as of that day, she now has to wait the five to seven years before she can actually get her record expunged. And so, and I know that that was a question about, you know, warrants and, and probation violations, but that is, an, that is just a, the first thing that came to mind in terms of a probation violation gone completely bad. And that's sort of that, um, she's just lucky she didn't get pulled over for, you know, running a stop sign or something, because she would have, that's it, you're in the cuffs, you're, you're going to jail. Absolutely. And that, that was one of my questions. I said, you, you haven't even gotten pulled over in the last 16 years? She hadn't gotten pulled over in the last, and it was a fight. It was a, and, and not to, not to um, make light of a fight. Uh, I know that some of you may know my own testimony where I have two felonies and two misdemeanors and ha had not been able to have my record expunged. Um, and luckily for me, I was blessed, I was blessed, not luck, it was blessings that I was able to become an attorney 
um, an assistant prosecuting attorney and now serving in the legislature, which is great. But when I asked her, has you had you ever, you know, you hadn't even gotten pulled over, she said, I have not even gotten a traffic violation in the last 16 years. So she's done everything right, or you know, for the most part, she has begun, you know, begun to live her life right, but then she's still being penalized for something that she had done over 16 years ago, a childhood teenage girl fight. There's a question in, in the Q&A for you, and, and then that is, you, says, your district is super weird. Gross Point Woods and Cornerstone Village. I'm wondering if you have to sell reform differently when you cross Moras Road. Now, I don't know all that uh, specific that detail, must be clearly you do. Right here in the district, absolutely. They know my struggles all too well. Um, and I have gotten to the point where I don't necessarily try to sell the, uh, you know, the, the most important people for me to help are those who are in need. And if you aren't in need, then you wouldn't understand. So I can't really convince you um, until you've experienced or until someone in your family has experienced something. Uh, and, and, and let me say this too. It's not those that are across Maras Road are not, they, it, it, I'm, I'm trying to be really careful about what I say. I'm not trying to offend any of my constituents, but they don't, they don't live in the, they live in a glass house. Let, let, let just, let's say they live in a glass house um, and they, some people like to throw stones, although they live in a glass house. Uh, and, and there are some who were very transparent while I was knocking doors where they would say, you know, I, I, I myself have a DUI. I was able to pass a DUI bill here in Michigan um, along with one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who had a, a, an addiction. He had a, a, a substance abuse issues um, uh, in his early life. And so we just passed a, a bill that says that you can have one, one, your first and only DUI expunged for the first time here in Michigan. And, and that's going to help a lot of people, including those people on the other side of Maras, because there were some people who were transparent enough to let me know that they too had transgressions and that um, or either their children may have had troubles growing up. And the more I share my testimony, the more people felt comfortable sharing their own stories. And then there were some who will never, ever tell. They'll never tell their stories. There were some who wouldn't even open their doors for me. Um, you know, across Maras, they would reach up and lock their screen doors because I was at their front door. So it, it, I had a lot of different walks of life and, and it was very interesting knocking doors in my district. That is definitely made up. And, and I'll explain to you so that you understand. I have a zip code in my, in my district that is considered to be the murder capital uh, of Detroit. And then I have a zip code in my district that is some of the most wealthiest people in the state of Michigan. Um, if you, if anyone is familiar with the furniture store art band or Anita Baker, the singer, um, who have lived in my district in the past. Thanks very much. Um, there was a question in the chat box um, that I, uh, Rebecca typed an answer, but I'd like to to address it. That talks about parole options being offered to youth. And what's being done in that area? Can you talk about that? Or is that? Did we say parole options being offered per, to the youth? Well, I was talking to Rebecca uh, in terms of, there was a question about that. Are we talking about life offenders, juvenile life? No, I'm talking, about, this is a question for Rebecca. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> No, and I'm so sorry. I, I wrote her back just to say that, you know, I mentioned a few bills in passing that I had, you know, looked through for today, um, not in granular detail, but um, offered to send her a write up of all of them. Um, but, you know, I think the states are beginning to, I think, have a lot more openness to parole options for young people. Um, obviously, we'd like to see that um, expanded um, where, where possible. We've seen um, you know, it's very, very interesting. I think a lot of these reforms too oftentimes start with young people. Actually, the, the bill you heard about, right, from Senator Peters was, you know, our vision initially on the deception bill was that it would, you know, ex extend to all people, right? We know that young people are particularly vulnerable to false confessions and the use of deception during interrogations. Um, but we also know that perfectly mentally capable adults also provide false confessions. Um, and so we knew, right, that to really socialize this idea, um, 
our hope, of course, was for everyone to really grasp the notion, the counterintuitive phenomenon that people falsely confess, um, even uh, mentally capable adults. Um, however, we knew that you know, an entry point into that reform was really to socialize it with young people. And, and when we did, you know, people really came to the idea. And this was in several states now. And um, in fact, just this week, the Utah, the Republican controlled Utah legislature passed the same piece of legislation uh, that was passed in uh, Illinois and Utah. It's now been delivered to the governor for signature. In Colorado, is it happening in Colorado as well? Colorado, there's a proposal. It's been introduced. It's already cleared an entire chamber, uh, not yet the second chamber. We're very hopeful. Bills have also been introduced in a range of states from Connecticut to Florida to Delaware. I mean, the proposal has really picked up. Um, I think, you know, for most people, the notion of lying to a child um, is something that people very quickly um, respond to. Um, our hope, of course, is that people also come to understand that people with mental limitations who are adults and adults without mental limitations provide false confessions with great frequency. Well, right. And Senator Peters talked about, you know, Chicago. I mean, I, Peter Neufeld's quote still lives with me, which is, you know, Chicago is to false confessions what Cooperstown is to baseball. It's the Hall of Fame, um, and it's it's really true. Um, and um, I just wonder if, in fact, um, you know, this can get some traction with adults because, you know, I work as a researcher for the National Registry of Exonerations, and this is one of the things that we keep track of. And um, while there are an awful lot of teenagers in there in the false confession group, there's an awful lot of adults in there too. And some are uh, have uh, some impairments, uh, but some are not. That's right. Um, and you know, the power of an interrogation room is uh, not to be underestimated. No question. And, you know, even, you know, two states did introduce bills this year and in New York last year and the year before that sought the deception ban and expanded to adults. Neither of those bills in New York or in Washington state even got a hearing. What's the status of, um, in New York, the reform in terms of early turnover of exculpatory or pretrial discovery in, in criminal prosecutions. Has, has there been a, an incredible amount of pushback on that? Uh, some degree of pushback. I mean, this was a transformational reform and we were so thrilled. This was a 2019 law that passed that for the first time provided, you know, pre-plea discovery here in New York State. It, it, in New York, defense lawyers were getting things like witness names, police reports on the day of trial. Um, and now we have a law that provides that information well in advance of a plea. Um, and I, I mentioned that, right, because we have a huge plea problem in this country. Um, I know from your data at the National Registry of Exonerations that of the nearly 3,000 exonerations in America, 20% of those people pled guilty. And I think we all know that that's a gross underestimate um, uh, because, you know, a lot of those sort of um, pleas came out of, for instance, drugs, which we're never going to know if people, you know, uh, we know, for instance, that there are presumptive field roadside drug tests that are used when people are pulled over. Um, they light up or show positive results on substances like folic acid that happened to a woman who was trying to get pregnant in Atlanta and was pulled kitty, over. Kitty litter. Correct. Kitty litter, Jolly Ranchers, my favorite treat as a child. Um, they all light up on and, and, and seem to suggest there are narcotics, when the confirmatory test is performed in the lab, many instances, it was not drugs and the person had already pled guilty. Um, and so, you know, we saw that in Harris County, Texas, um, and that resulted in, in a great number of exonerations there, but I believe that this is a much larger number. So we know that we have a huge plea problem, um, but, to re return to your question about discovery, it was um, this was a transformational reform. There has absolutely been pushback. Uh, Senator Peters talked before about some of the fear mongering that really grew out of the bail reform effort. There was also that extended to discovery. Uh, Mayor Adams' blueprint uh, for gun violence recently uh, also attacked discovery reform as as you know a problem that you know we needed to speed that up. 
Um, you know, and of course, what we know from wrongful conviction cases is an absence of evidence is the biggest problem that we face. So, right. um, so yeah, it's it's been unfortunate, but um, but I think again, so far, you know, that law has been protected, and uh, and and you know, obviously, we are working very hard to protect it. Steve has a question, but before I, I put, you know, I'm not pushing this button, but you're talking about the plea problem and, and I couldn't agree with you more. And it just shows the course of nature of how our system operates when you have someone locked up and they can't make bail and, you know, they come to court and here's the offer of the day. And whether they thought it was and it wasn't or whether they knew it was, wasn't, um, jobs are at stake and family survival is at stake. And so it's, you know, another strike, maybe you get a week, time served, whatever. Um, it's just that, and then, it, you know, six weeks down the line, here comes a lab report that says no controlled substance. That's the core oh. power of the system. My, my statement on that is that, yeah, I think that the plea deal machine is one of the more disgusting aspects of uh, much of our country's approach to public safety. It doesn't do anything to actually improve public safety outcomes. It becomes almost part of a numbers game. Um, what I also do know is that, um, I, you know, I have some friends and colleagues who are, are prosecutors. And my, my joke is that um, it makes them really bad in an argument because uh, they don't go to court. Uh, and so uh, my saying about some of the reforms and changes that we did is that um, sometimes you just got to take, we have a lot of prosecutors in the uh, General Assembly, and I will say, you just got to take them to court, because if there's one thing I know that uh, they're not going to be able to handle well is, is when, it, when they go to court, they'll be really good behind the scenes, like a plea, but sometimes you got to put a bill on the, on, on the floor, and you got to really put some pressure in, and I, I think my statement on that is basically say we need more people to be able to go to court. Uh, like there's a lot of changes that we need, but sort of breaking down the plea deal machine and giving people their day in court, it will have a fundamental shift uh, when it comes to public safety policy. Well, the coercive power of class X crimes, for example, in Illinois is not to be underestimated. And, you know, you're going to, the mandatory minimums and, and things like that, that you, that, that prosecutors have to deal with and say, okay, you can walk away in six months or uh, go to trial and everybody knows the, the trial tax. Um, Steve, you had a, a question? Yes, I do. I, I'm seeing there's a good question as well from uh, Cassie uh, Chu for uh, Senator Peters. I won't take up too much time, but I wanted to go back to the question of uh, bipartisanship. Um, Rebecca sort of mentioned that in passing uh, in her great review of what was going on around the country and sort of said, you know, we seem to be losing some element of that, partly it's the polarization of the country and whatever. But I wonder if you could put some more flesh on that. I mean, is that something that we think, that you think is now endemic to the system? Because if, if so, that would be a real tragedy because it was one of the, the elements of pride for all these past four or five years that whatever was happening on the national level, there was bipartisanship at the state level. If that's beginning to be lost, uh, that would be really essentially a tragedy. And then maybe uh, Senator Peters and Representative Yancey might want to comment as well from how they see it from their um, uh, uh, viewpoint. Whoever wants to say respond first, maybe with the, with the two legislators, they can talk a little bit about how, you know they're sitting in the in the cat seat, so to speak. I just I need a little clarification for on your question. How serious a problem is the loss of bipartisanship in terms of getting criminal justice reforms? So in the House and, and in well in Michigan, um, we actually have a Republican run House and Senate. Um, and I think I, th I think I had mentioned this earlier that we were able to get some bipartisanship on these criminal justice reforms that we worked on in both the jail project as well as the expungement laws because we're starting to see that that or or people in general are starting to see that this is not just an urban issue 
right? Or it's not just an issue that is uh, that's affecting Democrats. It's affecting people across the aisle just as much. Um, so we've had some willingness to work um, across the aisle, some willingness from our counterparts to work across the aisle to get these things done. We wouldn't have been, we honestly would not have been able to get these done last year um, in 2022. We wouldn't have been able to get it done if there wasn't any buy-in, bi bipartisan buy-in, because there it's a Senate, Senate and um, House majority Republican. Yeah, I, I, I'll just interject this because this is a little bit of a side story, but in in reaching out to to you before I reached out to you, I talked to some folks at Pew, and they said, um, "Would you like a Republican or?" a Democrat. And I said, well, if, if there's a Republican, uh, it would be interesting. And they said, well, the, the Republicans that are running for election are not going to do this. Uh, they're not going to, they're not going to appear on a, a public panel with a bunch of journalists from across the country. Was, I thought that was a telling comment. Yes, it is. And that's, that's really what my point is too, is whether, you know, however it, good it looks to get some bipartisanship as Representative Nancy said, whether down the line we're looking at, at least for this year, an election year, we're looking at a lot less. Well, so I'll add, I have a colleague, uh, a Republican colleague, and I won't say their name or also spoil for them, but uh, we work together a lot. Uh, I, you know, and um, he actually said he, he, I said he, so it gives away some people. It's not a lot. There's not a lot of Republican. Illinois is a little different than a lot of states. It's a super majority Dem state. Um, but so we have super majorities in the Senate, super majority in the House. But um, they they were like they basically were like we'll work on some things later. <laughs> like we'll we'll come back. And I I do think that even though we're locked into a huge battle around twenty twenty two electorally, um, and that is a thing that exists. And I think that there's an increasing amount, at least here in Illinois where we might see some people who are uh, politically on the very, very reactionary side of things. Um, you know, I do think there are some members um, who are very open to talking about uh, some reforms and, uh, you know, they get it. Uh, and uh, like you said, they're just going to be quieter. And, uh, you know, they... I think at one point we took a picture together and they said, I'll post this picture later. <laughs> they they want to post it, but they're like, later. We'll do it yeah. at a later date. Well, we and, have just, uh... You know, even, I, and I apologize, my, um, we have our Democratic governor as well. I've been working on a few commentations here in Michigan, um, one being Tracy Cowan, who had served 18 years for a non-violent non drug offense and working with her to get her, her, her sentence commuted. I was told last year, you're crazy. The governor's not going to do this. It's an election year. She's never going to commute this sentence or she's not commuting any sentences. Um, but but kudos to her that she didn't allow a, an election year to to prevent her from commuting someone's sentence who had, who had committed a non-violent drug offense over 18 years ago. Okay, so I, we have eight minutes left, so I want to see the rest of my time, maybe to the next, to the question that's on the floor from Cassie. Um, I can read it, uh, <clears throat> unless you can see it, Senator Peters. Uh, uh, Cassie wanted to know whether you had insights on a bill that your colleague uh, Camille Lily or Lily has sponsored, which is AP3902, about reducing the number of years a former prisoner must remain on the offender registry, sex offender registry. Are you aware of that bill, and do you have any comments on that? I'm not. Um, that's I, I, what I say about house bills. Is how do I say this nicely? I'm focused and tend to focus on Senate. But not sorry, Rep. I don't want to be rude. Oh, I don't look at Senate bills until they get to the House floor. No, I mean it's impossible to look at every bill that someone introduces until it makes it either to committee or the floor. I have no interest. So you literally, it's if the House bill comes over the Senate, I'll I'll look at it. But uh, I think the House files 5,000 bills and the Senate files 4,000 bills. And uh, I carry, I think I carry a lot and it's only 20 out of the 4,000. So um, I, I'll, I'll look into the bill if it comes over. What I do know is that we have an extremely punitive system that definitely we need to make changes on, but that's the extent that I know. And uh, Representative Lilly likes, she files a lot of bills 
Uh, and so I, I, if they come over in, in this year, the, you know, the year 2022, I'll, I'll take a look at it. I'd like to uh, pass Steve's question about bipartisanship to you, Rebecca, and if you can give sort of a national perspective sure. on that. You know, it's, look, I think it's complicated because it's hard to make an assessment when there are so many dynamics going on at the same time, right? Like we, I use the Virginia example, for instance, they had an election last year, um, but most of the states that were in this year, right, they're having elections. So that's just a dynamics that's going to run through this. And, and so I think it's hard to unpack that, but I did, look, it was, it was jarring to us um, that, you know, in a state like Virginia, where frankly, we had seen about six or seven innocence reforms pass in the last few years to for the first time see a bill just that we just passed the last year, get, you know, that there are efforts to repeal it immediately. And, and I really, you know, I've been doing this for about 15 years. I can't remember a time this has happened to us. Um, so it was, you know, it was quite jarring. Um, you know, when I did Kind of reach out and talk to some of the lawmakers there. They said, "Look, we're we're really in a very sort of partisan moment here," and you know, my hope, of course, you know, look, our our bills have been sponsored by Democrats and Republicans alike for many many years. They have been, you know, I mean, I, I don't think anybody wants to see a wrongful conviction, um, but you know, we were you know, obviously interested in more than innocence reform. We're interested in, in reforms to the entire criminal legal system um, and racial justice reform. And I think that it is, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's almost a wait and see. You know, my hope is that that's not the case. Uh, my hope is that Virginia is more anomalous and, and things might settle there over time. But, you know, it is true that for the first time, some issues, right, like even innocence issues, which had always been bipartisan, have been politicized. And yeah. that's, that's of concern. The word you used, I think, earlier was defense. Was, right. Well, right. In many ways, right. I mean, I, we are defending a bill right now in Virginia that we just passed. Um, and, you know, and, you know, and some of advocacy is also trying to kill bad bills, right? And, and we're seeing more and more of those crop up in our bill tracking systems, right? So that's, I think, you know, again, I think part of this too is a response to, you know, a lot of the uh, more progressive reforms that grew out of, you know, George Floyd's murder. And so I think we're really beginning to see some backlash, um, yeah. but there are all these dynamics going on at the same time, right? You have state elections, you have rising murder rates, you have you know, partisan politics, there's just a lot happening. It's hard to really unpack everything that's happening. And again, a lot of these states, they're like different laboratories. You know, you can't make a one size fits all statement about any, you know, the country has many states with many, you know, Utah just passed an incredibly, two incredibly progressive innocence reforms in a Republican controlled legislature. So I think, you know, it, it's case by case, but these are dynamics we're seeing. I have a question for Senator Peters, and that uh, what the, what happened on the uh, felony murder bill? So the 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 blowback on the felony murder. Well, did that pass? I'm 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 speaking from ignorance. Yes. There. So you know um, we were able to get that passed in the Black Caucus uh, pillars, um, and uh, you know the idea is if someone is directly involved in a, in a murder, they're gonna still be charged with felony murder. Uh, that's a thing in Illinois. Some states don't have that. Uh, if I pointed that out to some folks, it did have a controversial moment because, um, I gotta be careful, I believe the state's attorney from Cook County was in, on one of the panel discussions here, but uh, she's a friend of mine, but someone in her office, uh, I believe spoke out of pocket about charging a, um, charging someone who was involved in what would lead to a murder. And they said, I couldn't charge him with felony murder because of this reform. Mind you, he, you can charge him with like 400 other things and uh, he'd still, this person's going to still end up spending their life in, in prison. Um, no, not a judgment, like there's a whole bunch of other things there, but uh, it was basically seemed to be a hint, hint political hit job that I, I felt that was unnecessary uh, and ignored the fact that we have a situation where people are often locked up using at what was the previous law on that expanded view of felony murder that ruined lives, like just ruined people's lives. So many people 
who go to, we don't have parole, we have what's called the prison review board will show up at the prison review board hearing. And they basically spent 25 years just because they were in a car uh, with someone who, and their friend got shot and killed and they were charged with murder. Um, that's why we passed the felony murder reform in the safety act. Um, and that happens way too often. So um, that's the I thing that we're we'll talking Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Uh, California has, has done something similar to that, I think, where you see uh, people who were held accountable, um, you know, as far away as, you know, they were st still in the parking lot, um, you know, 50 yards away, um, but because they came in the same car um, and, and they got essentially LWAP, life without parole, and you see them getting sentence reductions um, to time served in, in many cases. And we could take a string, a line from all the, the reforms and changes that we've made and actually throw them together on why this is horrible for public safety. You take a kid, they're with some friends, uh, they're nearby, uh, somebody gets murdered, they get brought in, then they're held without bond. Uh, they're stuck there for days, they can't pay bond. Uh, which if anybody's ever been in holding, I've only been in holding for, I think seven, eight hours doing some civil disobedience. It sucks. Uh, so think about multiplying that for multiple days. Uh, it might smell like shit, uh, which is an amazing combination. If you get a sandwich, you don't know if that bread's got mold on it or not. You get a little bit of toilet paper if you're lucky. So you're, in hold, you're being held Maybe you go to Cook County Jail. We'll get to that. That's not the best place. It's a 120-year-old building uh, that's absolutely atrocious. But so maybe you go to Cook, maybe down here. Let's just say you're held. Um, so you have all that going on. And then when you're interrogated, this is all before we made all these changes. So you're a group of friends. Your friend gets murdered. You're held without bond, stuck in there. And then in Illinois, before all the reforms we changed, you are being interrogated. Next thing you know, they're telling you, you know, your friend, your friend said you did it. If you just tell us what, you know, you just, you just tell us, you're, it's going to be, you're going to get the best sentence. Don't worry about it. You just confess and you let me know. And then we create the false confession capital. So fundamentally, what, if we think about those lines, we change it so that that person shouldn't be being brought in and held forever. They shouldn't be charged bail. If they're not a threat to somebody and there's no, there's no evidence that says that they were a threat, they get to go home and they live their life, go back to school maybe. And then in that process to figure and determine whether they're a threat to somebody or not, the police don't need to lie to them. And that to me is what we've changed in Illinois is a through line that I think all these pieces of legislation all, all hit on. And if you add into it, that police officer has a body camera that shows what was happening uh, at that moment at the scene of the incident. Those are all things that we just add in that add more transparency, create greater trust, uh, and isn't stuck in a cynical point. So I love to, the one thing I'll say about this whole uh, panel I'm going to use and I'm going to take is I'm going to go to somebody and just go line by line, bit by bit. We always look at these policies almost in, in a form of a vacuum of each policy but they're actually just a through line that you could essentially take a 16 year old kid and fundamentally ruin their life, both in the short term and the long term. And we change it so that they don't have to go through that experience anymore. And we don't need to have any more stories about someone who's like 45 years old, desperately trying to get out to go see their parent who's struggling to live in that moment. So that, that's my, Robert's rants as my staff calls it, I'm done, I'm done. No more ranting, I'm done. I want to say um, thank you to all three of you for how you have fundamentally changed lives and will be changing lives through what you've done, through your policy changes, through your legislation, um, and the untold number of people who won't even know um, how their lives have been fundamentally enriched by what you've done. So uh, my thanks to you very much. Thanks for sharing today um, and go forth and, and keep that bipartisanship alive.
I have to echo that, Maurice. Let me thanks to all of you. This was a wonderful, in fact, it was a good news panel, and it's a great way to end what was really a pretty um, bleak uh, symposium in many ways, because we were looking at how likely the reform movement is to continue. And uh, the weather report is not great, um, but you know we'll hopefully be a little bit more optimistic. Um, but I say I want to thank all of you, um, and I want to invite you. We're going to uh, close for um, take a break for a half hour. This is the end of the formal part of the <clears throat> excuse me of the symposium, and we're going to go heading into what I think is one of the most fun parts, um, which is our prize event. We're going to be announcing our Trailblazer, Trailblazer Award winner for the year and our Journalism Prize uh, Award winners. Uh, and they're all gonna be speaking, talking about um, what they do for a living uh, and maybe a little bit more, uh, just as inspiring, I hope, as you guys were. Uh, and our trailblazer uh, this year is um, uh, David Innocencio of the Prison Writers Project at The Beat Within, which is um, something we're really proud to have. So uh, please join us again in a half hour. We'll take a break. Um, and if you can join us, but thank you again for uh, taking your time to spend with us. And I'm sure I speak for all the journalists who are listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>